we'll have a small session for questions and uh, that you may have any questions on what I've been speaking about, any questions on what I've not been speaking about, and any comments or answers to questions which I have not asked you, nor have you asked yourself. So we, it's open ground now for questions, answers, and comments. Yes. My question is still, there's still some confusion about what is really real. Is it only what I see or feel that's real? Am I creating my whole life as a vision? You speak to these other levels and stuff. Can it be had now, like you say, can I be aware of them and be aware and make something beautiful of this place without having the, the, the you know, all the, all the bad things about it, the pain and the suffering? Very good question. I'm very happy you're an old friend of mine through YouTube. But the point is that when you say what is really real, you have to be prepared for a shock yeah. that nothing is really real. That's a shocking statement, but it's true. Yeah. Nothing is really real. real. Reality is the power of experiencing a created reality. That's real. Consciousness is real. Everything else is created. And the uh, other answer would be that we make our own definition of reality, as I was explaining, and therefore everything is real. Because we have no comparison. Now you said, can we also have this experience and also the other experience, then we would know this is not real and we'll have a better joy, joyful place in the drama. Yes, it's possible. This is how it's possible to go within and find the cause of all creation. And then you could still have this drama taking place outside, but you know it's not real. And you play very well on a drama, on a stage that you know is just set up. And you have a great time. We were supposed to have a great time in this creation. But once you find out how it is created, who we are, then becomes real. So this is possible, what you have just said. So the metaphysical answer is nothing is real except the power to establish what looks real as consciousness. And what reality is, we have given definition to reality. And therefore everything is real. If we don't use the power of consciousness to create illusions, we don't create shadows, we use the power of illusion to create realities. Every uh -huh. level looks real. And therefore we have created realities. And that's the definition. So we don't have any other way to know what is real unless we go in and find nothing was real. Everything was created, dreamlike. Sorry, when you speak of that, that friend, you know, the, the perfect living master that, 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 that you envision, uh, some people envision as their God, their belief. But what, who are you speaking of when you say that? Are we, are you speaking, are we speaking of ourself? Are, are yes. We are, when you see a perfect living master talking to you, you are, it's your own self speaking to you. Mm. An arrangement that you made before you were here. Okay. Otherwise you wouldn't be having the perfect living master speaking to you because he's part of the illusion made real. One more question. <laughs> yes. One more question. Is there any chance that, that we can not be trapped or, or is this trap so real that it could never uh, be gotten out of. Will yes. we eventually, or you can be stuck forever? You can be trapped forever if you never made any arrangement from the top to I get to get back on the system. But since you made the arrangement, therefore, you'll get back because of it. What happens is that the level of creations multiplies the nature of self. We are so many selves here. Actually, we are one but we are looking like so many here. At every level, the manyness increases. We become more and more, it multiplies. Right now, we are so many. The little bacteria moving in a human body is several times more than the total population of this world. And yet, for them, there's the whole world in a physical body. They're all living things too. So when you look at life, how it has expanded, it's gone into so much multiplicity and has become so many that the manyness is supposed to be a part of the process of this creation. 
you can get trapped into this manyness forever. But what is forever? When we say that time is not created there, we have no time there, what is forever? There is no forever there in our home. Forever is created by the mind here. So when we ascend the mind, the forever finishes, so everybody is back. So even though we say forever, the forever even ends when you go there. Take an example. You go to sleep and have a dream. You go to a new island. All people are blue. If you have seen the movie Avatar, and you have all blue people there, it's a different thing. You have never seen them here, but you see them in a dream. And you see billions of people there. And then you see a sky here, different color sky, yellow sky, stretching infinite. And you say, how long has this been here? How long have these people been here? Millions of years. They are trapped. Those blue people are trapped forever in that yellow skyed universe. And then you wake up and you find they were never trapped. Because the trap itself was created by the illusion of reality. It's the same thing here. So although it looks like they're all trapped, at the ultimate level, all traps disappear. And we find there was no time, it was a created experience. I, I, I think the, the, only, the one reality that I'm sure of is that I'm gonna, this body's gonna die. And I'm, I'm almost looking forward to it in a sense because then I'm thinking, well, at least then I will, like when I wake up in the morning, I, I lose the dream state and I, and I, and I get the awareness state of this life. So when this body dies, I'm going to be forced into, whether I, I like it or not, that reality, I hope. You're a good seeker. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Hi. If I may, I have two questions. The yes. first one is about free will. When you mentioned that we already wrote our script, so when we came here, we knew that um, what we're going to choose and that our choices were dictated by two factors, our environment and also our genetics. So is there any way out of these factors or this script per se? Could we uh, consciously choose something that is outside of these factors? Yes, that's what meditation is all about. We can choose outside of these factors. Okay. Through meditation, through meditation, we can escape this particular setup here. And we can escape and change everything. We can rewrite the whole destiny. We can see the destiny. After all, when I say it's predetermined, where is it, is it recorded? There has to be some record somewhere. And it is in the level of the mind. It's at the, what we call the causal stage where all causes take place. And that's where it's recorded. Who recorded it? We recorded it. We can change it there and come back and it becomes a different life. Yes. Through meditation, we can achieve that state. Okay. And the second question is about Satkan, our true home. You said that that's, uh, we know we are back home when we feel oneness. We are one. And um, and at the same time, I heard you saying that there are souls that never left. So there are beings that are happier because they had the human experience or other experiences in beings that are um, there that didn't have those experiences. If it's oneness, how does it have different beings? Very good question. <clears throat> this is a way of explaining in physical terms. Because I have said that there is no time and space there. Therefore, there cannot be have anything like a being like we know it here. So there are no beings like we know here. These beings exist in time and space. They exist in consciousness. And the consciousness creates the experience of manyness. And the manyness is what we call the individuated souls. It's a single experience in which one can feel one is many. And it's that kind of experience there. It's not beings like here. Okay. Yeah, thank thank you. you. Welcome. Yes. Yes. Uh, having a master, a perfect living master, <coughs> or versus not having one, as I'm not initiated, I've been aware of Sotmod since 73, but you 
Now I went out and played. I kept it in my mind, but I went and had my life. I'm 60 now. And now I'm coming back and I'm feeling more drawn as I'm getting older and reaching that, that point of death. And I want to know and I want to have awareness when I go. Should I seek the master, which I am feeling that I'm doing now, and go seek him out or just do the meditation and if I do, am I going to make the same progress as if I had a living master and went to India tomorrow and got initiated? Or if he even did it, sir. You should seek for the truth within yourself. Don't seek a master. Seek the highest truth inside. I want to awaken to the highest level. Seek that inside. Master will find you and seek you. What about the sound current and the connection that you're supposed to make with the that, That's good. The sound current is a good practice. I talk about it. But can you do that? I mean, it says in a lot of the Satma books that the master has to connect you and give you that connection to that sound current. The sound current is in all of us. We all are already connected, but we are unaware of it. The master puts the awareness in us. He does not put sound current in us. Sound current is already there. Many people hear it much before they see a master. Not only that, many people have a past life master and they were connected to the sound current. A born here have never met a master and they can hear a sound current because of previous connection. And then they find a master, then they find out that the sound current was connected last time. I, I think this is more a comment that I'd, I'd like you to comment on. The, the uh, ability, the feeling of free will gives us the ability to seek. That free will involves a lot of other things that we don't care for. And somehow, I know finding a master means a lot, but the process of, of free will is, is very uncomfortable. And is it just so that, you know, ultimately the only advantage is to be able to seek or to decide to seek? I, I agree with you. The seeking is the only true use of free will. But otherwise, free will, some people enjoy. And for many people, it's very uncomfortable, especially when we have to make hard decisions, where you have to choose between a rock and the sea, what is it called? Where you have to decide between two evils, and we have to decide one or the other, we can't escape it, becomes a very difficult decision for us, and free will becomes a big trap and a very uncomfortable one. But seeking is a good use, the best use of free will. I agree with you. Feel at that time that his soul is... Um, roaming in the higher regions. Okay, now that story, maybe others are interested, I'll tell them again. She's asking about an event that happened with my master's master. My master was, whose picture is here, Baba Savan Singh, starting his S, Sant Satguru Savan Shah, S, S, S. His master was Baba Jamal Singh, who was a disciple of Swami Seth Shiv Dyal Singh. Shiv Dyal Singh says, from Agra. One day, when he was not a master, still a seeker, Baba Jamal Singh had a very strong feeling that he wants to go and see his master. He missed him. And he felt he was missing him so badly inside that he would like to go run and go and see him. So he wrote a letter to his master, Swamiji, said, my respected Guru Maharaj Swamiji, I am missing you very badly. I want to come and see you. And please give me the time when I can come because those are old days. Even mail took a long time to go and people had to travel long distances to reach even 300 mile distance. He mailed that letter and after a month a reply comes from his master saying, my dear son, Jamal Singh, I'm very happy to receive your letter and to know that your soul is roaming around in Khandramant in the higher regions. And Jamal Singh thought to himself, his soul is going nowhere. This must be a mistake. That this must be a letter meant for somebody else, sent to me by mistake. So he wrote an, again another letter to his master. Master, I received your letter, but this is not meant for me. My soul is going nowhere. All I wrote was, I am missing you so bad that I want to see you immediately. I want to have your darshan. So please give me time to come and see you. 
and he mailed that second letter. And a second reply after a month came. I am very happy to know, Chairman Singh, that your soul is roaming around in the higher regions and so far as coming to see me is concerned, come next, next month on the first Sunday, something. Carrying these two letters, he went to his master and he said, Master, you wrote these two letters. They are not meant for me. In these two letters, you say my soul is roaming in higher regions. My soul is going nowhere. I was just missing you so much. I wanted to just have your darshan and I am very happy. So his master laughed and said, let's go and do some meditation inside. And there were 10 or 15 people sitting outside and they both, Chamal Singh and Swamiji went inside and after half an hour, so they came out and there Swamiji asked, Chamal Singh, tell me now, when I wrote that letter to you, was your soul going roaming around in the higher regions? He said, yes, master. I am not asking, Master says second time. I am not asking if your soul was roaming around now when we did meditation. I am asking, was your soul roaming around in the higher regions when I wrote the letter to you two months ago? Yes, Master. It was roaming at that time. Then to all the puzzled people sitting outside, like her, who is puzzled, and me, I am puzzled. How come he didn't have any experience that his soul was roaming around in the higher regions and yet the master says it was roaming around and then when he took him for half an hour meditation, he confirmed that it was roaming around two months ago. And the Swamiji explained to the waiting people like us that sometimes the masters blindfold us and we do meditation but we do not see anything. They block this, the vision part of us. So we can hear the sound, we can hear other things, but we do not have the spectacle that is existing there. But we feel great love and devotion for our master. That arises. We begin to miss the master a lot because of that experience. And we don't know where it's coming from. We don't know that the soul with its eyes blocked has been moved up there. Because even though we are not in a physical body, in the inner body, we still have two senses, nirt and surt, the power to see and the power to hear. These senses continue even higher up. So if the nirt is blocked, the power to see is blocked. We don't see anything in meditation, but the feeling becomes very strong of a bond, of a bonding with the master, wanting to have his darshan. And that's what happened to him. And he had blocked his vision for that. Then the master explained to other disciples sitting there, that the reason why masters sometimes do that is because just like there are so many distractions in this world which prevent us from concentrating attention, there are equally distractions in the other worlds also. And sometimes the masters know this particular individual with this background is going to be attached to those distractions and never make any progress. So they block your ex visual experience of that stage, take you higher up and then open up the visual experience for you. And that is what happened to Baba Jamal Singh. Okay. It's an interesting story. Because some people feel that we are having love and devotion growing in us. And we feel a lot of closeness. But we don't see anything in meditation. Don't worry. You may be blindfolded at that level. It sometimes happens when you are easily distracted. I have seen some disciples of great master in my time. Who actually wrote to him. That in meditation we were so distracted by inner distractions, which were even more than the physical distractions here. And we would have made no progress if you had not helped us to go by blocking our vision. Okay, thank you very much for this session. We'll meet again. Yes. See, we like we deathbed page in the life sport. If somebody's on the life sport. What do you say? You should pull the plug or he's like paying his karmas, even if he's in coma. Or, like you, should we pull the plug or not? You see, in this life, this life is built up of karma. If we had no karma, we wouldn't be here. That's very strange that we wouldn't be here in a physical body if we had no karma. How would we be here? What for? We are here to experience 
give and take with people. We are here to experience pain and pleasure. We are here to explain, uh, experience ups and downs of life. Therefore, everything we do here is in the process of karma. Of course, karma is of different kinds. There is a karma that we created as a cause in a past life. When we come into this life, we pay off. Supposing you hit somebody in a past life, deliberately hit somebody, come here, that person comes in a different form, hits you back. You say, what is this? And he says, no, it's just accidental, I hit you or something. And you wonder, how could that happen? Why did this accident happen? It was payoff of an old karma. It's the end of karma, not the beginning. Then there is karma where you deliberate, use free will. Say, I want to do this and deliberately do something. That's the cause for which you are not ready for something to coming later. In Indian language, we call the first one pralabd. That means destiny created from past actions. And the new ones we call kareman or if new actions we are creating, which the reward will come later. So our life here is mixed up of these two things. Bulk of the life that we have from birth to death is pralabd, destiny. Already the events are fixed, what will happen? And they keep on happening in time. And the gaps in between are where we use free will and say, no desire to make a choice now. And we make choices and create new karma. And this cycle keeps on going on. And the karma. But since we create more karma than we pay off, we are very sharp in creating karma because of our mind. Mind is constantly deciding things. Karma is not created by a physical action. Karma is created by mental intention. When you mentally say, I want to do it, you created the karma already. Not when you physically act upon it. Therefore, since our mind is constantly making decisions like that, we accumulate a lot more karma, karma and karma or karma for the future, than we pay off. So, the excess karma keeps on going into another void, into a cloud. We call sinchit karma or the reservoir karma with the reservoirs building up. And the whole machine of reincarnation and being born again and again here operates very smoothly because of the large reservoirs we have. So even if we try to be very karma free in a particular life by living in God's will and say, I won't take a decision, whatever happens, I'll go with the flow. I go with the flow is a means of not creating karma. That means whatever is coming by circumstances, go with it. If you live that life and think that you have no karma, the reservoir pulls out the karma for the next life. So the reservoir is a big thing. The reservoir also affects our attitude. So it affects sanskars, which means the events that take place in life are only because of events of past life. But the attitude we have towards events, attitude we have towards people, is based upon the whole reservoir of a lot of karma from the several past lives. So the whole system operates very well in creating attitudes and creating events. And in these, we do a lot of things here to wipe out karma. The difficulty is that we cannot accept pay of karma. We can't say that a karma we create now, it can be washed off by an opposite karma. Which means, supposing you hurt somebody. And then you please somebody to cover up. You will be punished for the hurt. You will be rewarded for pleasing. They don't cancel each other out. If they could cancel, a lot of us could cancel them. But we can't cancel them out. They stand alone. Every karmic intention and action stands alone by itself. It creates its own result. And we, in our own conscience, develop a morality. Society helps us to develop that. Norms, social norms, church norms, religious norms, they help to develop a certain norm for what is good, what is bad. Mm -hmm. And those are ingrained in our conscience and we say, oh, I should not have done this, this was bad. It becomes bad. We say, this was a good deed I did today, it becomes a good deed. We are the makers of our own morality inside our mind. So once we make the morality and we do actions, the action that we think is evil is punished. The action we think is good is rewarded. And both go side by side. To such an extent 
that if the actions are really horrible, deserving hell after death, and you've done a lot of remorse and done good actions to deserve heaven, at the end of the life, you get a choice. Okay, 15 days in hell, 20 days in heaven. Which one do you like first? At least that choice is given. Free will is used there. Which one you go first? But you go to both. So it doesn't cancel each other. But all the actions we take here, they have a consequential result and a part of karma. So whatever you want to do, do it. Uh, in general... Suppose if in, I get in a case like in, that, should I tell Raj to pull the plug or not? <laughs> in, in, in general, you can do... If you have a specific question, I will answer it in the okay. personal question. But in general, uh, whenever you want to do something, I will tell you to generate less karma, to go with God's will, Master's will, somebody else's will, and not your will. Because unless your will is involved, it doesn't create karma. Karma is created by your will. People who say, I live in God's will, save themselves from a lot of karma. The difficulty is they don't know which is God, what is God's will. They say, now what is God's will? One of the Indian mystics, Rumi, Marana Rum, in one of his Masnavis answered this. He says, people ask me, what is God's will? It's very simple. If he's given you a spade in his hand, he has expressed his will, dig. If he's given a pen in your hand, he has expressed his will, write. He has created circumstances around you telling you what to do, do it. That's God's will. Therefore, if you follow the circumstances around you and follow them, which is called go with the flow, if you go really with the flow, you don't create karma. You're living in God's will. And if things happen in that, you're paying off the old karma. So you can reduce the level of your karma. Then the, another very good news is that the reservoir, a big cloud of karma that sits on us, and creates, recreate, recreates us forever, traps for us here. When you get initiated by a perfect living master, first thing he does is to destroy that whole cloud. So you do not have rebirth based upon that cloud anymore. Then the rebirth can only be from the karma created in this one life. And it's generally much better, the next life is much better than this, more conducive to your spiritual path than this life. So, that's another thing I was going to talk to you later about the value of initiation by a perfect living master. It's not merely that you find a friend who can give you guidance, many other things that happen along with it. Talk to you about it later.